All right, welcome everybody to the brief training on um, court documents, interpreting court documents, figuring out what you need for a given uh, situation, and uh, interpreting FBI background checks to figure out what happened, who you need to contact, um, and what sort of documents you're going to need to request. So let's go ahead and get started. We're going to start with the I-485 instructions and talk about what um, criminal um, court documents are required, what those are, and what they look like. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. And I'm going to do this. Okay, can everyone see the I-485 instructions? Awesome. We're going to go down to pages. 12 and 13. It starts on 12, but it's really on 13. Just at the bottom here of 12, it starts certified police and court records. It generally says you must submit certified police and court records for any criminal charges, arrests, or convictions you may have. And then on page 13, it breaks it down. So if you were ever arrested or detained for any reason, anywhere in the world, including the United States, but no criminal charges were filed, you're going to have to submit an original or certified copy of the arrest report, and then essentially proof of the final disposition, which is to say proof that um, charges were not filed. So an original or certified copy of the arrest report is going to be from the arresting agency. It's going to be the Tulsa Police Department or maybe highway patrol, um, and it's going to be the law enforcement agency. So as an example, I'm going to flip over to this example um, from one of our clients. So this is from the Tulsa County Sheriff's Office, and you can see at the top here it says arrest and booking report. This is what we're looking for when we need an arrest report. It talks about the location of the arrest, the location of the occurrence, who was arrested, where they live, etc. In this case, we were able to get it from the actual court um, because the arrest report was filed with the court. So you can see there's a stamp from when it was filed with the court. Okay, um, so this is an arrest report. Let's flip back over. Essentially, if somebody's been arrested for any reason, you're always going to have to get that. So that's what that looks like. Okay. Um, Here's another example. If you were ever charged for any reason, even if you weren't arrested anywhere in the world, you must submit, if they were arrested, the complete arrest report, which we've already talked about. And we're going to need certified copies of the indictment information or formal charging document and the final disposition. So an indictment, an information, or a formal charging document are generally the same thing. They're called different things in different jurisdictions. What it is, is the document that the DA files to say, we're starting a case. We're bringing a case against this person. In Tulsa, it's called an information, which I know is confusing. And information is not usually, you know, it's, it's not a singular noun that we talk about, but in this case it is. So I'm gonna scroll down here. And it says right at the top here, this is the, you know, in Tulsa County, it's a misdemeanor state of Oklahoma versus Johan. And it says information at the top. So what this document is, is it alleges the counts against the person. So count one was driving under the influence of alcohol, count two, unsafe lane use, et cetera. This is what the information is. In some jurisdictions, it might be called an indictment, or there may be another word for the charging document, but it's the document that's filed to start the case. So you're always gonna need that, okay? Um, you can see it also includes like the witnesses endorsed for the state of Oklahoma, okay? So if there's been a criminal case, you need to get the charging document. In Tulsa, it's gonna be the information, okay? And you will need the disposition. And the disposition is just what happened to the case. Why was it ended? Um, what, was, what was found in the end? So in a lot of cases, it's going to be a, a plea and an, and an order of sentence based on a plea agreement. 
in other cases, someone might have gone to trial and uh, were found guilty or not guilty, and then you will get copies of those documents. So you need to prove what happened in the case. Um, so I will flip back over to Johan's records here and show you that. In his case, he entered a plea of guilty, which you'll see a lot of. So we have, this is his plea of guilty and summary of facts. This is the uh, document that he filled out to plead guilty. Several pages talking about all of his rights, due process, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. This is all part of the guilty plea document, okay? And then after somebody pleads guilty, the court is going to enter an order. Um, so in this case, it's an order of a deferred sentence. Um, so it talks about each count, it accepts the plea um, and makes findings that it was voluntary uh, and then enters whatever the um, sentence is, okay? Um, and usually some fees and costs that are required to be paid. So those are the disposition documents. Like I said, instead of a plea, it could also be a, um, it could be that they went to trial and there is a finding of um, guilty or not guilty. In a lot of cases, it's gonna be a plea agreement or sometimes the um, case was actually just dismissed for one reason or another. It may be dismissed in the interest of justice. It may be dismissed because um, the police screwed up and now they can't bring the charge because they violated some rule. Um, there could be a lot of reasons. So you may also use an order of dismissal if somebody was charged with something, but then for one reason or another, the charges were dropped um, and withdrawn and, and the case was ended by charges dismissed. So you would get that order of dismissal. Okay. Um, and then on C here under the I-485 instructions, we talk about uh, if somebody was ever placed in an alternative sentencing or rehabilitative program, uh, such as drug treatment, uh, deferred adjudication, or community service program. I want to note that deferred adjudication is a different thing than deferred sentence. So deferred sentence is kind of like, here's your sentence, but I'm not going to make you do it if you behave. Um, you know, you, you need to be under probation or um, under supervision, um, but we're not actually going to put you in jail unless you screw up again and get arrested or, or break the law and then you have to serve that sentence. A deferred adjudication means that an adjudication is like a court decision. It means that nothing like there's not an entry of guilty or not guilty. It's essentially a way for somebody to um, go and do this program that's supposed to be rehabilitative so that they don't have um, something on their record. Um, and so it's not an entry of a, a finding of guilty or not guilty. It's kind of this program that somebody can do instead. And of course there's, there's drug court or drug treatment community service program. And obviously it tells you here, you're gonna have to get the same stuff, arrest report, um, the indictment or information, any plea agreement, if that's applicable, um, the final disposition. And then you'll also have to show, um, you know, the record that they completed their community service or um, the conditions set for the deferred adjudication or this drug rehabilitative program. Okay. And that's going to, that's going to differ based on jurisdiction and what the court ordered. Um, so you may have to just kind of ask around, call in, ask what that document is, do a little research. Uh, yes, Whitney. And all of that is found at the county of which the crime occurred. Or the court, because sometimes this will be a municipal court, okay? Uh, we often run into county court, that's a lot of what we see, but um, there are city or municipal courts that can also bring charges and, and put people in jail and um, impose, uh, you know, impose um, punishment. So you have to pay attention to, to what court is uh, over the case. Good question. Okay, and then D here talks about any arrest or conviction that was vacated, set aside, sealed, expunged. This is where we have problems sometimes because sort of inevitably our clients don't keep those records. 
and then everything is sealed and typically what we have to do is make a motion with the court to unseal the records or or reopen the case so that we can get the records and then reseal them or whatever um, so this usually involves an attorney um, because it's a little bit more work if the person just doesn't have the records they didn't keep a copy of them uh, so typically if you have a situation where somebody was arrested convicted but then it was expunged or um, sealed then come talk to an attorney and we'll figure out what we need to do at the bottom here it also talks about sometimes obviously you can't get certified copies of something um, and you can explain in a full explanation. You can provide a full explanation of why the documents aren't available um, and any kind of secondary evidence that would show the disposition. This is, you know, worst case scenario, this is the last thing we wanna do, but if we truly can't get records for some reason, despite our best efforts, we can also um, provide this sort of secondary evidence. Okay, I also want to talk about the couple of paragraphs here towards the bottom. People do have to disclose all their arrests and charges, even if the arrest occurred when they were a minor. But it's important to know that an adjudication of juvenile delinquency in a delinquency court is not actually considered a conviction under immigration law. OK, this is a little more complicated. If somebody was truly in um, juvenile proceedings in delinquency court and they were you know found to be delinquent that's pretty straightforward then that's that's a finding of delinquency that's a juvenile um thing so that's not considered a conviction um but if they committed a crime at 15 or 16 so they were a juvenile but they were charged as an adult then that is going to be considered a conviction you can always come to an attorney for help with this but i wanted to um, point out kind of the nuances you you sort of have to report you know any kind of arrest um or charges but it's not actually a conviction if it was a finding of juvenile delinquency um, also, the second paragraph here says, in general, you don't need to submit documentation relating to traffic fines and incidents that did not involve an actual arrest if the penalty was only a fine of less than $500 or points on your driver's license. So typically, if somebody gets pulled over, they're not arrested, they just get pulled over for driving without a license, they pay a ticket, we don't have to submit that evidence. We don't need to get it. Okay. Um, now, if they were arrested instead, then we're gonna have to get information based on the fact that they were arrested. Um, and if the traffic incident resulted in actual criminal charges or it involved um, alcohol, drugs, or injury to a person or property, then we are going to have to get those records. But we see a lot of traffic records, um, you know, that are, or just like traffic fines, right? A speeding ticket, a ticket for you no know, driver's license, a ticket for unsafe lane use, whatever it is. If they weren't arrested, if it didn't involve drugs and alcohol, if there wasn't a, um, a an injury or property damage causing accident, then we don't need to get those records. They're, they're not required. Okay. And finally, what I want to talk about with this is um, all of this requires certified um, records. And what that means is typically there's a you can't see it very well on the scan, but I'll try to show it to you. Typically there is a um, machine that puts this certified imprint into the pages. Um, so you can't see it really very well in a, um, in a scanned version, um, but there would be an imprint, a physical imprint of the, um, of the kind of this like seal of the court. Also, um, you'll see at the end here, um, this shows that it's certified. It's a it's a stamp and a, a signature um, showing that the um, you know, certifying that this is a correct copy. So that's what a certified copy is. It's hard to see on the scan, but um, typically it has that kind of imprint stamp and then um, the stamp and the signature that it's certified. Okay, any questions at this point about the um, criminal court documents? If not, we're going to jump over to an FBI background check and go over it because I know that these are kind of uh, confusing. So I'm going to use this one as an example. 
I do have a quick question. Yes. Um, for juvenile um, delinquencies. Yes. So misdemeanors, they're, um, they do have like, you know, probation or they have a sentencing for, you know, drug paraphernalia as a minor. They were tried as a minor. Um, these are not convictions in immigration's eyes. But they do need like the basic facts of what happened, like the arrest day, they need the details of what happened, the sentencing, but they don't need any any certified court document for those. So like for, for DACA, for instance. So if it's truly a juvenile delinquency adjudication, it's not it's not considered a misdemeanor or felony, it's a finding of delinquency in a delinquency oh, court. Okay. Um, you have to disclose all arrests and charges. Um, but it's not considered a conviction. So, um, you know, so, but it says here, if, if you claim that an arrest resulted in an adjudication of a delinquency, not in a conviction, you must submit a copy of the court document that establishes that fact. And sometimes uh, I actually haven't personally gotten um, records from, from a delinquency finding. Mm -hmm. I haven't had to before, um, but you can work with an attorney and we can reach out to folks over at the, you know, who do juvenile offenses to um, figure out how we need to get um, kind of proof of that. So we do have to prove that an arrest was an adjudication of a delinquency and not a conviction. What do you think, running by that one more time, as far as the difference between a misdemeanor and a delinquency? So a, a delinquency finding, it's a wholly separate system. So misdemeanors and felonies, you know, this happens up in this court system. Oh. A juvenile system, it's a completely separate system, um, specifically for juveniles. And it's not, people aren't found to be convicted or guilty or anything. Mm -hmm. They're found to be delinquent and then placed in this sort of rehabilitative oh. juvenile program. So either you're delinquent or not. Those yeah, are the I think so. Okay. Uh, and I'll be perfectly honest, I haven't done a lot with this, but I talked to somebody recently about it, um, actually about this question who works in, in juvenile court and, and I understand it to be a finding of delinquency. Okay. And then they, you know, so it's, but it's a completely separate system is the thing. It's this juvenile delinquency system as opposed to a court system. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if there aren't any other questions about that, I'm going to flip over to the FBI background check. And I picked one that has a lot on it so that we can kind of go through this just um, so I can point some things out, maybe answer some questions, show you. This is, there's a lot of information here and I understand that it's not organized in a really helpful way. Um, so like, you know, this is just kind of legalese, this, data related to this record was requested. Um, so we're gonna keep it coming down. This is the information about him, sex, race, birth date, citizenship. This is just information about the person that we requested the information about. We're gonna keep coming down here. Okay. We've got more information about his biographics, his, his biometrics. Okay. Right here, arrested or received. This is the date, the year 2006, the month, December, and the day, the 9th, okay? This person was arrested. The agency was the Police Department of Elm Springs, Arkansas, AR, okay? Uh, the prints, there were fingerprints that were taken that same day. So, so far we know that he was arrested on this date by the Elm Springs Police Department in Arkansas. That already tells us a whole lot of what we need to know, okay? We're gonna keep coming down here. There's a second entry here. It has the same arrest date by the Elm Springs Police Department in Arkansas. We have a failure to appear charge. We have number three. Again, this is all the same. We've got a failure to appear. We're gonna keep scrolling down here because there's more information. But so far we know when he was arrested, by whom he was arrested, where he was arrested. So you know who you need to reach out to to get copies of the, the documents, right? Okay. More information, okay. Well, there's more information down there, but I guess this is about all of this about Arkansas here. Okay, 
So we have a failure to appear, we have a failure to appear. FTA, which I assume is failure to appear. So, um, so you're going to need to reach out to Elm Springs, Arkansas, get that arrest record from the police department. So in this case, we know that it was the Elm Springs Police Department, not um, necessarily the county sheriff or highway patrol. You need to reach out to the Elm Springs Police Department um, and then um, figure out where the person, you know, where the what happened with the case and go ahead and request those um, documents. Okay. And then we come down here and we've got some more criminal history. Okay. Arrest date. Go ahead. A uh, quick question about um, from the agency. Um, could we also look up the county of which the case will be um, heard um, opposed to the agency? You like can first. Yeah. Yeah, you can look it up. I don't know what Arkansas's um, system is like. Oklahoma actually has a pretty good system. OSCN is pretty good. Um, and we can find a lot of records that way. Some other uh, states don't have um, quite as public and easily available um, systems, but I always search. I will search for the county um, and see if I can find any county records and I'll also search for the municipality in case it was actually um, the city that um that brought charges so i'll go ahead and do that as a preliminary matter um, but it really narrows it down for you so you can look in both of those places and you can give them a call if you need to and and find out um more about this okay and then so um is it do you find it common from when you get records from the court clerk um that the arrest document will come with it if we ask for it or do you think that I, we should automatically ask for the agency arrest records i i have to ask for them specifically in in my practice in my experience i have to specifically ask for i need the arrest record that was filed i need the um the information or the charging document and i need the disposition so i will specifically ask for all of those things Can you say that one more time? Arrest record. I'll ask for the arrest record, the information or charging document, whatever it's called, um, in that jurisdiction, and then the disposition document. So a plea, an order, sentence, any of those records. Okay. So this guy has uh, some additional criminal history here. We have another arrest date in 2015. This happened by the PD police department in Glenpool, Oklahoma. So the Glenpool police. Um, we have a little more information from this failure to signal on turning. We know it's a misdemeanor. And here it says ref to immune prosecutor, which I, um, understand to me and refer to the municipal prosecutor. So in this case, I'm going to go to the city of Glenpool and um, look for records. Disposition, see this, there's a little more information from the Oklahoma charge here. It has the disposition here that says he was found guilty on this date for fail to signal. And this was the fine that he had to um, pay. So this has been a little bit more helpful than the, the Arkansas record. Um, you're still gonna need to reach out to the Glenpool city to um, get this information, but this is an example of this would be a, a municipal case as opposed to a county case, okay? And we will scroll down here. Okay, so we've got no valid driver's license. This is similar, uh, found guilty on the same date and he had to pay this fine. Okay, and then this, we have a much bigger offense, carrying a concealed or illegal weapon. This charge was dismissed. It's going to be important to get the order of dismissal on this, um, which may be a single document that says, um, you know, found guilty on um, the other two charges, but then charge dismissed on this charge. It may be all of that one, that one order, but you definitely want to highlight that this charge, which is pretty significant, was dismissed. Okay. We have improper turning. So this guy kind of just got um, 
slapped with the book <laughs> on the same day for all of these things. So um, let's keep coming down here. We've got something else. This is a 2001 arrest date by the Tulsa Police Department for DUI, referred to the municipal prosecutor. So we wanna to go to the Tulsa uh, Municipal Court. Um, it's possible that it could have ended up in county court, but it says it was referred to the municipal prosecutor. So that's where we're gonna start. That's the, that's the starting place here, okay. And this one doesn't have a lot of information um, like the one above, possibly because it's so old, it's 20 years old. And that is the end of the record. So this guy has a lot. Mm -hmm. um, some of them have nothing. It just says no arrest record was found. Some of them have records like this. Hopefully now you feel um, like you can interpret the records enough to go hunting and get the um, copies of the court documents that you're going to need from the agencies and the courts that you're going to need. Mm -hmm. Any questions about this? You already know that I do, but I don't think I've done all. All right, go ahead, Whitney. Um, so as far as like the the actual phone call with the county clerk or whoever you're talking to to get these records, am I gonna say like I'm gonna rattle off the list? Like for each charge, I need the arrest record, the information or charging document, the disposition, any pleas or anything. Am I flooding her with all of this? Like how, I guess, do I go about it if it's a lengthy charge Sure. like this one? So, well, in this case, you're going to be calling three different places or two or three different places, yeah. right? <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Um, and what I've noticed is that each agency has a different way of, um, you know, requesting documents. So you may give somebody a call and they'll say, oh, I need you to send me an email to this email address and list what you need. Okay. Um, if it's in Tulsa, you're just going to send a runner down um, to get the documents from the courthouse. We don't need to call over there. We can just go get them. Okay. Um, yeah, some people may require a, a letter request or an email request, or they may just say, hey, go ahead and tell me what you need. Um, give me this information. So it's different based on the jurisdiction. If it's in Tulsa, we can send a runner to go get it. Okay. And then obviously every agency, every county municipality have their own charging rates for yeah. these documents. Yeah, exactly. All right. Other questions? I would also uh, make a note. So it can be hard to get criminal records where they're is a juvenile involved, the separate from, from the juvenile delinquency, if there is a, a minor involved. So even if the person who committed the crime was not a minor, but a minor was involved, often it's hard to get those, um, those, those records are protected to protect the identity of the minor. Um, so we can be limited on what we can get uh, without a subpoena on, in those cases. So if you have a, a difficult case like that where you can't get um, something that you feel like you need, you can come to an attorney, we can talk about options. Okay, one more question. And then yeah. <laughs> so in, in an off chance in which we need to do like a background check on an international client, like for instance, a K-1 visa, um, we're bringing someone from abroad and that person requires background searches. How do we facilitate that? I know that doesn't happen very often. That's a special occurrence, but we wouldn't be able to use FBI background search on them because they're living in yeah. Serbia. Right. Know? So usually I, I put the onus on the on the client. If we're helping, if they're in their home country and they're and we're helping them come here, we tell them go get you need to go get a, a background check in your country. They can do it far easier than we can. And they just send us the results. Mm -hmm. Or or send it to, yeah. Yeah, unless it needs to be for for a consular interview. Sometimes I've seen where it needs to be like sealed, and they take these sealed results to the interview with them. Oh. Um, but yeah, they they might get um, a background check and then and then just send it over to us if they're in their home country. Similarly, for some like VAWAs, like we need to show good moral character for the last three years. But let's say they've actually been living; they like maintained a a permanent residence, um, and I. I'm pulling three years out. I, I can't remember if that's true or not. Um, it's for, for the for the period. Um, the 
but I had somebody who um, had lived in Mexico during that period where they needed to show um, good moral character as well as in the US. So I told them, hey, you need to get um, a background check from the state of Aguas Calientes or wherever they lived. Um, and, and then they went and got that and then brought it to me. So typically, if it's if it's a foreign background check, I put the onus on the client and say, you are better situated to get that than I am. You probably have family or friends there who can help you get that. Um, so uh, that's what I have them do it. Yes, Ashley. Um, are we still charging the client for uh, records or is that an admin fee? that's included? That's a good question. Uh, I need to ask Lorena because I know that's been kind of an issue. Um, it's been kind of a question lately. I need to ask Lorena and get back to you all on that because I know that we've been kind of nickel and diming, no, not us, the, these agencies, right, are nickel and diming us for, for records and it's frustrating to the clients. So I think Lorena had said, let's call it an admin fee, but uh, I will double check that and get back to you with a confirmation. It's a good question. Okay, other questions about court documents and background checks. All right, well, if that's all, I'm gonna go ahead and end this um, training for now. We may do a follow-up training if you end up thinking you have other questions or we need to go a little deeper into any of this, but hopefully this has got you um, set up to interpret the background checks, find out what you need and empower you to reach out to those agencies and get exactly what you need. So thank you all so much for being here today. I hope that was helpful.